today's chicken farm has is is nothing like your like mom's farm. You know, I grew up on a small family farm where I got my first chore was to go out and gather the eggs in a wire basket. And uh, I can tell you that the the egg industry has really been a model for the use of technology and scale and production and biosecurity measures in terms of how they operate their businesses. And uh, just out of a, a quick show of hands, has anybody ever actually been in a, in a chicken farm, a, a layer operation at all? Oh, well, we got several of them. Well, for those of you that haven't, you're going you're gonna to get to see something for the first time because I'm going to spend a little time talking about just what a chicken farm looks like and what the implications are so that you understand why the issue of business continuity becomes so important. And so I'm going to take a little bit of time and just say, let's, let's talk about how it works. And it all starts with a, with a day-old chick that's hatched in a hatchery uh, at Highline, uh, who's who we work with, who is the, the largest uh, producer of baby chicks in the United States and the world, for that matter. And uh, those, those uh, baby chicks are uh, hatched in an operation that is completely HEPA filtered. We, we talk about the, the use of HEPA filtration for... Uh, PERS, and, and I can tell you that almost all the breeder farms in the United States have been HEPA filtered for a long, long time. And uh, that's just been a standard practice for, the, for that in particular industry. Those eggs are then transported to an incubation uh, facility. Each of these different bays uh, holds racks of eggs, and each day uh, another, another egg rack would be pulled out. And so they spend 18 days. Do you remember how, how long does it take to hatch an egg? Tim, 21 days. So you spend 18 days in an incubation phase and then three days in a hatching phase and they, they control the temperature in, in specific ways to enable that, uh, those eggs to hatch. And then those birds are transmitted in a HEPA filtered uh, truck to a pullet growing facility. Now this is a, this is a facility that, and the, and the farm that we're gonna talk about today in general is uh, Fremont Farms of Iowa, which is near Grinnell, Iowa. Uh, if you're on uh, Interstate 80, uh, near the Malcolm exit, which is just east of Grinnell, you can see both the pullet farms on the south side of Interstate 80 and the, and the, and the layer farm on the north side. These are all individual pullet farms where uh, the, the chickens are, are, are grown. Uh, they take butcher paper and put it on the bottom of the cage when, the, when they're little day old chicks because they just fall through clear to the bottom if you, you know, if you, if you didn't have some method and by the time get the birds grow big enough that the cages will hold them, then the paper has disintegrated and it just goes away. So it works really, really well. Baby chicks will spend 16 weeks here growing uh, and maturing into an adult. And so what they do is they will, as the chicken gets older, the daylight is shortened. Does everybody remember how, the, how sexual maturity is brought about in chickens? They start laying their eggs as you lengthen the daylight. So during the pullet phase, they shorten the daylight so that you don't get premature hatchability. So after 16 weeks, then they are uh, transmitted uh, over to the layer farm. And this is, uh, this is the layout for Fremont Farms of Iowa. So here's your, here's your 160 acres. And you can see that nearly the entire 160 is covered with buildings. So each of these buildings uh, will hold one particular flock. Uh, these are the original buildings here. These are, uh, if you've heard of the term high-rise buildings, uh, in a high-rise building, the chickens are up on the second floor and the manure drops through to the bottom. And newer technology was in, uh, adapted in these barns right here where those are called belt battery cages where each particular layer of, of chickens has a belt underneath it and the manure is removed from the house into these manure storage buildings that you see here on a daily basis. So this particular farm uh, has its own feed mill. You can see that right here, and it has its own on-site breaking plant. So all the eggs from this farm are transmitted. If an egg is laid at the end of the building over here, it will travel mechanically all the way to the end of this barn and then all the way up to here and then into the breaking barn. So it's really a a fabulous uh, process of technology to, walk, to, to see how that works. So uh, if you were to look inside any of our barns on a given day, this is kind of what it would look like. The, 
First, I would point out how clean the concrete floor is. That floor is swept 365 days a year. You could sit down and have a picnic lunch right there every day in every one of those barns. The eggs come from the far end of the barn on a belt, and it rolls into this, what is called an escalator. So the eggs, they very travel very slowly, you know, just, you know, maybe a foot every five or ten seconds, and then they drop into this escalator, and the escalator goes down to a belt that then transmits it all the way into the braking plant. We also have cage-free barns. Is Bob Hansen in the room? You know, we want to make sure we're animal welfare friendly as well, and so I thought I'd show you a second farm that we've built, which is a cage-free farm. And, uh, well, John's here. Yeah, well, John, well... So this is a farm that's up by Eagle Grove that's under construction right now. Has it, does anybody eat uh, Hellman's Mayonnaise Light? Well, there you go. Liz does. Uh, these, the, all the eggs from this particular farm go to Hellman's Mayonnaise Light. If you go to the grocery store and you look and says, our eggs come from cage-free, this is the farm where those eggs are, are produced. Uh, this, this is what it kind of looks like in that farm. So to say that it's cage-free is, is a somewhat of a misnomer in that there is a coop and a roosting place that occurs that's what I call a split-level house. Okay, so on this side you can see the upper start, the part of the cages. We have roosts and different layers where the chickens can stand and house. And way up in the back, which is a little bit hard to see because it's blocked by the chicken, is the nesting box where the eggs are laid. Like, and so the way it works is uh, in the morning, you, the lights come on. That's what stimulates the chicken to lay her eggs. We have breakfast about 9 o'clock. Usually after they eat breakfast and have a drink, that's when they defecate. You want to keep them inside the cages during that time frame so that they will defecate on the manure belt that is within that cage. So that manure is moved on a daily basis. So that about 11 o'clock in the morning, this is a door right here down at the bottom that opens up and... Uh, no pun intended, but everybody comes flying out about 11 o'clock, and they can run around on the floor and scratch and, and uh, have happy bird time all day long until that evening when we draw the birds back in by uh, a night light, which is a rope light. And I've, the best way to describe it, Mark, is to, you know, when, when we're going out to the bars at night, the, the bars that get our attention are the ones that have the neon signs. Well, those are also the way that we attract a chicken to go back into the cage at night so as the house lights are dimmed the rope lights come on and that attracts the chicken to come back into the to the uh, to the cage for the evening so that's kind of the way a day works in cage free in either case oh, uh, in total then uh, the United States produces uh, 6.8 billion dozen eggs or 75 billion eggs per year. It's a lot of eggs, okay? And this is a shot coming out of our farm, uh, out of the, so that it, it comes out of the barn and it goes through a wash cycle uh, in our farm, and then it comes into an area where the eggs are candled, and what they're looking for are bloods, cracks, checks, problems that need to be taken out. This particular lady right here is picking up eggs that didn't wash very well, okay? And this little little return line takes those eggs back in to get washed a second time prior to going into the breaking plant. And if I could make any comment, I mean, the kind of cleanliness that you see right here is, is every day. This is, this is what these farms look like every day because sanitation, biosecurity, and cleanliness is just absolutely critical for the success of what we're trying to do. Um, so now, from the next step then, the eggs are going to go through a wall. You'll see this wall right here, and that you're going now into what's considered to be the breaking plant. So in, in our farm, uh, we break the eggs. Now, of the 75 billion eggs that I've described, 60% go into grading or shell eggs, okay? So 60% go into the store and they go through a grader machine which every egg gets measured for its weight and then the grading machine actually sorts 
the egg and routes it into jumbo or large or medium, okay? And those are like $3 million machines. And so that's where 60% of the eggs go. Our eggs go into breaking, and so our, our eggs are used for other kinds of food processing, like cakes and craft foods, or if you stay at a Hampton Inn where you have the, the bags of, of eggs that are boiled, and then they throw them in the pan at, the, at Hampton Inn or whatever. So those kind of you know, pre-scrambled uh, egg products. And to give you an idea, these machines will break 150,000 eggs an hour, or 44 eggs per second. These eggs then uh, are pumped through a homogenizer in our operation, and they're stored in these stainless steel tanks. All right? And then we, we ship them out on tanker trucks. We produce 10 to 12 tanker loads a day. So here's what I've got. I've got about three days of storage on, a, on this farm. And I want you to stop and think about now the implications of a, an outbreak of high path avian influenza. And, and if you understand what happens traditionally with an outbreak of a, of a disease, if this was an outbreak of some other farm and our farm was located within the, the uh, control area or the surveillance zone, and traditionally, it's very likely that we may not have been able to ship product. And you can, one can only imagine, you know, how long it would take for us to be swimming in liquid egg product if we didn't have a, a method to ship that stuff. And so um, that was the risk that became readily apparent to everyone in the, in the egg industry is what happens with an outbreak of high path avian influenza. And so a working group got together of stakeholders that included uh, the University of Minnesota Animal Health and Food Security Group, uh, the Iowa State University uh, Center for Food Security and Public Health, the United Egg Producers, uh, the United Egg Association, Egg Sector Veterinarians, and the USDA. And they all got together and said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with high path avian influenza be that's just down the road? And so what they did is they first got together and they said, we need to make a plan. We need to make a plan. And so the plan kind of worked like this, and we'll, we'll go through each of these segments. They came up with a risk assessment model, uh, voluntary preparation steps for producers to take in, in anticipation of a potential outbreak, and permit guidance was developed, all working together. So the first process that they went through was to say, let's, let's do a risk assessment of the kind of eggs and egg products that are being you know, manufactured or produced uh, in Iowa and the United States. And so they started looking at each of these different uh, products. You know, we produce non-pasteurized liquid egg. Okay, that's what we ship out. The tanker that leaves us goes to pasteurization. All right, so all of our liquid egg is pasteurized. It's just not pasteurized on our particular site. And each of these, each of these different models of production were analyzed and were given a, a rating of saying, okay, if there's, if there's high path, what's the, what's the potential risk of avian influenza being transmitted in that particular product or egg? Okay, and so that's, that's where each of the products were looked at. The second thing that was done was they went out and they looked to the producers. And the, this is a, it's, I cannot stress this, this is a voluntary program. You know, I, I could choose as a producer not to participate in this. Of course, then if that case comes along where we have a high path avian influenza break, I'd be dumping liquid egg in, the, in, the, in my lagoon for a while until that ran over, and then I'd be dumping it in the river until the DNR showed up. And, you know, so you, you just can't imagine the logistics. but. What they did was they came first and they put together what were called pre-approved audited minimum biosecurity standards, okay? They standardized the process of biosecurity. And I don't think if I were to list the kinds of things that they're talking about, it wouldn't be anything different than what we do in our normal processes of biosecurity. They just wanted to make sure that every producer had those kinds of policies and procedures in place. 
Secondly, they wanted to make sure that they knew where the farms were in relationship to each other so that each site was located with a uh, GPS coordinate. And third, then there was an epidemiological questionnaire and data to put together, you know, you know how, many, how many birds are on the farm and what's the potential impact of, of that process and what do we have to do uh, to identify what's going on. And, and finally, then they, they established what would be the, the, the process of actively surveilling for high path avian influenza, which is real-time PCR using oral pharyngeal swabs, and we'll talk about that. The other thing that they wanted to monitor was production uh, parameters. Just like PigChamp monitors pre-weaning mortality or average daily gain, one of the things that we monitor on a, on a very, very routine basis is how many chickens died this week. You know, when we, when we put 135,000 layers in a barn, we don't add more chickens to the barn through that flock cycle. Right? So we're constantly keeping track of how many birds that are left. And on any given particular week, about 0.15 would be kind of a rough average of how many chickens would die on a percentage basis. So what they said was, well, what's, what's significant? Okay, so if, if we're monitoring flocks for signs of disease, and if we see that there's any increase in mortality that's three times greater than the last seven-day average, or anything that's greater than 0.3% on a weekly basis, that should be reported, okay? So that was agreed to, and then again, all flocks that are in the, the control area are to be monitored for the P, by PCR. So the testing criteria that they used were uh, to collect uh, one pooled five bird sample for every 50 dead or euthanized birds in a house. Now remember, did you, remember I showed you that farm, every house is considered to be a separate flock, so we would be collecting 28 samples at a very minimum every day from each of those farms. And then uh, you, it, the, to be able to move product, you got to have uh, negative tests and you got to have negative tests on two subsequent days. So the sampling, there's no way that that Patrick or uh, or any federal uh, or a federal employee that could come in and say we're gonna we're gonna just continue to start testing all your birds. The manpower that it would take to do that would be, be too great. And so again, as part of this process of cooperation, they've trained our employees on how to collect the samples, and so. They, they go through a training process, there's a DVD and a certification and all that sort of thing. And so they, they swab the, pharyngeal, the oral pharyngeal swabs, they stick it into the BHI broth. Those samples then are transported to Iowa State. Now the diagnostic lab samples then or reports go back to a website that is controlled by the commander. And the commander then, he gets the information in and when he sees that everything's been negative, then he's the guy that uh, gives the permit to move product. To give you a, a, let's, an example, here's a, if, if we were running Nestron eggs, we've, we've, we've had high path diagnosed in Carroll County, okay, where I live. And this is day zero. And so right away they've established a control area because they've already know that where the where the farms are and they're going to go out a certain distance and I don't know what that is Eric maybe you know let's let's pick 10 miles in the control area and they're going to go they're going to check every farm we can collect the eggs and we can hold those eggs for a, a day or two again I said in the case of our farm we can go three days maximum so on day one then swabs are collected from all of the farm uh, flocks and submitted for a real-time PCR. Again, we do the same thing the next day, and eggs are still held, and finally then on the third day, if we've got two days in a row from all these flocks, now I can move product, and I can continue to move that product as long as I'm continuing to have negative clinical signs and negative PCRs. That allows us to maintain business continuity uh, in the face of a break with high path avian influenza.
one can argue that you know eggs and egg products are not live animals and I will I will grant you that but we do have to move pullets as well remember I talked showed you those pictures of those day old chicks we have to move those guys and so I went into a little more detail here just to give you an idea of some of the biosecurity steps that are in place uh, first of all again everybody has to know where the where those day old chicks are coming from the production parameters of the breeding flocks that are supplying the eggs have to be monitored just as the flocks that are in the control zone and if everything is normal then you have to have certain biosecurity uh, steps in place for instance the, the, the interior and the exterior of the transport vehicle has to be cleaned and certified and checked off the driver is not allowed outside the cab or if he does get outside the cab the cab has to be completely disinfected before he gets back in again the tires and the wheel wells must be cleaned and disinfected before leaving our operation has the land and the plans in place to have a drive-through disinfection facility coming in because think about this we're shipping ten tanker loads out a day and we have probably got that many coming in or more of corn and soybean meal and dical and limestone and all the products that are coming in and so we have our we have the land across the road purchased waiting for the day that we have to construct our own drive-through disinfection procedure for all the truck traffic that has to come in on our farm likewise the truck drivers are not allowed to enter the premises they have to return to the truck directly to the hatchery by the same route avoiding any close proximity to any other premises that might be in the area and then a shower and change of clothes are required and then the chicks themselves are placed on a 21 day quarantine where they would go through the same oral pharyngeal swab process as your regular layer flocks would so that's how we move live animals under that particular scenario so in summary you know the the SES plan grew out of a stakeholder concern for the delivery of egg products our business could not survive very long if we could not move product in the face of an outbreak now if our farm was the place where where the outbreak occurred well that's another story you're you're gonna liquidate the farm at that point that's what happened in Mexico what six or eight weeks ago eight million birds got their heads cut off because of avian influenza so working together all the stakeholders involved understood that there needed to be a mechanism in order to move product in the face of a high path avian influenza and they all got together and developed this voluntary program there was a website that was developed that everybody puts their information into so that the incident commander at the federal level can make the decisions upon who can move and who can't move and everybody has cooperated quite well in making this process work and I believe that this could serve as a model for what could happen in the swine industry in the in the face of a foreign animal disease outbreak certainly there are differences between eggs egg products and the movement of live animals but I think if you think about the framework of how you would establish the process in the swine industry, I think this is a really, really good framework.